All right, everybody, it's time to look at defense against effectiveness. Okay, so we're looking at something here where we've got four basic kinds of pathogens. There's fungus, viruses, bacteria, and protozoa. You should be familiar with an example of each just so you generally understand what they are, what they look like, if they're a eukaryote or a prokaryote, that sort of thing. For instance, bacteria are prokaryotes, viruses are not alive, fungus are eukaryotes, as are protozoa. Now, the reason these aren't able to get into our bodies is, God, there's a couple of them. First of all, all our cavities are protected by a few things. First of all, the pH probably isn't favorable, like stomach acid kills them if we ingest them. Other cavities, like the ears and the nose and the mouth, have sticky mucus, earwax, they trap invaders. Also, there are these enzymes called lysozymes. And they come from our lysosomes, and they basically kill pathogens as well. And then trachea cilia, which can be seen here, also push them out. And aside from that, our skin is a continuous barrier that prevents them from making their way in. Skin is dead cells. It's tough to live on that. And it's many layered, and it's dry. Now, blood clots are something that you should be familiar with. It's a process by which your body makes the enzyme thrombin, which is able to produce this fibrin net that captures erythrocytes and clots your blood. Now, viruses are small, about 100 nanometers or a micrometer. They have this protein coat. They are not truly cells. Inside of that, they might have DNA or RNA. And they can inject it into, say, a bacteria, as you see here. And antibiotics are not effective against them, as we'll talk about in a second. Bacteria, for review, are larger, 1 to 3 micrometers. They are true cells. They have DNA in loops called plasmids, and antibiotics do fight them. Now, antibiotics block certain metabolic pathways that bacteria use to produce cellular objects like the pili, like their DNA, like ribosomes, like the cell membrane, the cell wall, and even the flagellum. So if you block those processes, you can't create any new bacteria. So viruses do not operate with those same metabolic pathways. They use your cellular machinery and therefore are unaffected by antibiotics. Now, inside of your blood, there are a few different kinds of cells. You should be familiar with their general functions. And we're going to focus a little bit more closely on leukocytes, which can be also called white blood cells. And there are types, the B, the T, and the macrophage cell. B lymphocytes produce antibodies, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, before we can talk about the immune response, you should remember that antigens are cellular surface molecules that help you to identify if something is a foreign object or not. There are also these objects called antibodies that are produced in response and will bind to a specific antigen. This marks them for destruction and also prevents that pathogen from entering any other cell in the body. So the macrophage is usually the first thing that the bodies, pathogens would find if they're inside of the bloodstream. And macrophages use these antigens to recognize very simply if the object is self or not self. So this is called a non-specific response. They ingest them through phagocytosis or the endocytosis of a large object. And then they digest them using lysozymes from lysosomes and then eject parts of the dead uh, deconstructed pathogen. For that reason, we call them phagocytotic leukocytes, but of course their more specific name is macrophage. Now, this leads us to a larger idea of the whole immune response in your body. A pathogen is ingested by a macrophage where it is then digested, and the macrophage then sort of wears the antigen like a little hat called the epitope. That epitope will then signal a particular B, or sorry, a particular T cell with the appropriate sort of complementary cellular protein to then go activate an appropriate B cell. And then B cells do one of two things. They will either differentiate into plasma cells, which are really the antibody factories. They produce antibodies that are now specific to the pathogen that was ingested before. Or they will stay behind as memory cells and provide the basis of long-term immunity. They can very quickly become uh, plasma cells should they find another pathogen sometime in the future, thereby allowing your body to skip this whole process and basically cut to the chase. Now, usually in your body, there's more than one 
antigen on the pathogen, which means that there's going to be more than one type of T cell and more than one type of B cell being activated so that you can get one more than one antigen, or sorry, more than one antibody that affects the pathogen. This is called polyclonal selection, and it's a little bit more of an accurate model of how these things happen. Now, if you want to get one kind of antibody, say for diagnosis or therapeutic treatment, say the diagnosis of pregnancy or the therapy of the rabies virus, then you may want to do monoclonal antibody production, which is a clever way of getting one kind of antibody out of an organism. You inject a mouse or other small mammal with a, with a pathogen so that it goes through its immune response. You then take specific B cells from its spleen, where you find a good number of B cells. You then take those B cells and fuse them with a myeloma cancer cell, and that produces something called a hyperdoma. That allows them to survive uh, longer, they don't die in a short time span, and they continually reproduce and go through mitosis. And they're also a little bit better at surviving outside the body. Now these cells are going to produce uh, antibodies, and they are going to clone themselves, and that allows you to select a specific one type of antigen for therapy. Now, your immune response can be either nonspecific or specific, and also active or passive. If we are looking at the uh, immune response as a determination of self or not self, that is going to be the uh, sort of nonspecific response. That will eventually lead to a more specific response that your body actually goes through the immune response in response to a specific pathogen. I'm saying the word response a lot, but that is a specific immune response. As far as active and passive immunity goes, um, active events are basically that immune response we were talking about before, where it's a uh, really active cycle of events that produce an uh, antibody product in response to a pathogen. As far as passive immunity goes, that's when you get your antibodies from another source, maybe a mother, maybe from an injection, but it's not something that you've done actively in your body. Now, vaccinations are a way of getting this uh, sort of passive immunity. Usually a vaccination is given, you receive an altered form of the pathogen, and it brings your body through a primary response that you usually beat without any sort of symptoms. Memory cells remain behind because you went through the immune response yourself. And then a second exposure to that infection would then result in those memory cells providing a very quick resolution of the infection. And again, that's because you received a uh, rather altered version of the pathogen that then produces an immune response within your body. So in this case, if the vaccination provides you with that, you have produced your own memory cells that make your own antibodies, this could be a specific response. If the vaccination is just for those antibodies, then that would be a non-specific response. Vaccinations are good for a number of reasons. They can nearly eliminate diseases and prevent the spread of them either in a pandemic worldwide or a local epidemic. They are, are preventative, so they reduce the cost of this medicine across the world, and they also provide people with herd immunity. There are some risks. People can be allergic to them. You could possibly overload the immune system, and they have been made with mercury in the past, although this is mostly a social fear and not an actual risk. They have not been linked conclusively to autism or any sort of mental retardation, and so that is generally not considered a true risk. Moving on to the last topic, the HIV virus is the pathogen that gives you the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and it infects your T cells in a rather insidious way when it uh, finally moves past the macrophage infection point to the T cell infection point. The process of exocytosis actually bursts the cell open, destroying the T cell. Now, this can progress to uh, AIDS in a number of years, depending upon diet, but people with AIDS usually die of a non-lethal infection that they simply don't have the immune response to combat anymore. Remember, T cells are very much in the middle of the immune response. HIV viruses infect cells, again, in sort of a mean way. They uh, adhere to cell surface proteins, and once inside, release their RNA and some enzymes. Those enzymes actually go through reverse transcription, turning that RNA into DNA, which they then insert into your genome. Man, that's weird. Your genome now has the HIV virus inside of it, and by simply reading the DNA in your cells, you will be producing viral proteins that your body will then make into a full-blown HIV virus, 
through exocytosis. This disease has many impacts socially. There's stigma and discrimination and an inability to find work and caring for the sick. Economically, you have no working age population. Your gross domestic product goes down. People are working instead of going to school, so education will suffer as well. And there's lots of in, uh, international stigma against countries that have a uh, full-blown AIDS problem. So a rather tragic event. But that's the unit. Boom.